So I've been asked to talk to you about uh, targeted radiation treatment for uh, neuroblastoma. And um, perhaps in time on a tradition, is that better? In time on a tradition, I've got no commercial or financial interests to declare, but a lot of gratitude, uh, particularly to Joining Against Cancer in Kids, which is a, a charity in um, the UK and the United States, which raises uh, money for uh, neuroblastoma, also to uh, Cancer Research UK for funding this work, and uh, what is ever else is left of the English National Health Service, um, which uh, supports me as well. So the title I was given was Targeted Radiation, which is perfectly fine, but this treatment is known by other names as well. So you may have heard of radionuclide therapy or the term which we perhaps prefer, which we think uh, encapsulates best what we do is molecular radiotherapy. But essentially, they all mean the same thing. So pediatric molecular radiotherapy uh, is what I should be talking about really specifically in relation to neuroblastoma, although it does relate to some other diseases as well. Um, I'll mention a bit about molecular radiotherapy in general, then come on to how we look after children with cancer, the staffing and uh, facilities that you need to give this sort of treatment, the radiation protection issues which arise, a little bit about neuroblastoma, but I realize you're already uh, very well informed about that and some of the practicalities uh, that we deal with and do symmetry and then a little look into the future to see which way the field is going to change in the uh, years to come. So molecular radiotherapy conceptually is a very very simple idea. It's as simple as jumping off a board into a pool. But to do it well is actually quite challenging. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. In concept, we're using a drug to search for tumor cells within the body and then using radiation to destroy those tumor cells. So it's a bit like having a rocket, the sort of thing you might find in North Korea. Um, the rocket moves and it takes with it its warhead. So the rocket is a missile or a vector which carries the warhead, the radionuclide, the radioactive element that causes the damage. And the two things I should be talking about most in terms of the missile is MIBG, which you've perhaps heard of, and uh, octreotate or dotatate, uh, which is another one which is uh, investigational. And the two most commonly used warheads are iodine-131 and lutetium-177, but there are others as well. So one of the simple ways of, of looking at what we do is we're using radiation uh, not in the same way that we normally use radiation. In normal radiotherapy, we're using it more like surgery, where we identify where the tumor is on the basis of scans, and we direct the radiation specifically at that area uh, in much the same way as the surgeon directs his scalpel at where the tumor is. But this is more like using radiation as a drug. So the advantages are that... Um, it's not constrained by anatomy. Wherever in the body areas of tumor might be, the drug should find it. And because the uh, drugs are biologically targeted to neuroblastoma cells, it can deposit relatively high activities of radiation in and immediately around the uh, tumor, but relatively low levels to most normal tissues and it kills the cancer cells because of the radiation. Um, and I think it's important to remember that because when you have a choice of treatments, people will say, well, which one is better? 
but it's they're just the way of getting it there um, rather than the actual thing that that does the does the damage to the cancer cells one of the good things about molecular radiotherapy is that you do not need to actually directly target every cell. As you can see from this little cartoon here, a cluster of cells, only the one in the middle is targeted. But the ones around the edge are also affected either by radiation that passes from the centrally targeted cell into the next cell or by physiological uh, mechanisms because when you badly damage a cell it can send out chemical messengers which uh, cause adjacent cells to to die so these are called bystander effects and um, they can be physical uh, and biological so and I apologize if what I'm going to say now is relatively um, UK centric uh, but I suspect similar principles also pertain in Australia. So in looking after children with cancer, fortunately, cancer in children is relatively rare. So care tends to be uh, focused on specific principal treatment centers for pediatric oncology where highly specialist care can be given. But not all the care of the child is delivered there. It's done in association with a number of pediatric oncology shared care units where uh, general pediatricians in uh, community hospitals will provide the less specialist elements of care under the direction of the principal treatment centre. And then there's further outreach beyond the uh, shared care unit uh, into the community proper through general practitioners and uh, pediatric oncology outreach, outreach nurses. We have in Britain several bits of authoritative guidance which say how we should look after children. And uh, one of them says that children and young people should receive age appropriate, safe and effective services as locally as possible, not local services as safely as possible. So the key thing is that we want every child to have access to the best quality of care, to the best treatments, even if that means moving uh, some distance away from home for part of the treatment. And in relation to radiotherapy for children, uh, the Improving Outcomes Guidance says that where radiotherapy is high risk, very complex, or requires specialised equipment, it should be commissioned from agreed super-regional, national, or indeed even international centres. So the focus here is on uh, quality and getting the best for every child. So this is a map of the British Isles and you can see that there are just around 20 principal treatment centres scattered throughout Wales, Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But at the moment, only the two shown in red in London, uh, where I work at University College Hospital and at the Royal Marsden Hospital, which is just on the south side of London, uh, have the appropriate facilities, staffing and expertise to deliver molecular radiotherapy safely in a proper paediatric environment. Um, the two centres shown in yellow, Glasgow at the top there in the west of Scotland, has just constructed a new uh, children's hospital and has built appropriate facilities into that so that's good so they will be uh, starting treatment and in order to prove to improve equity of access for families we are working with colleagues in Manchester to try and get them to have what it takes to do this because at the moment in London I'm treating patients from every corner of the UK and it's good that they have access to that treatment but it would be nice for some families if they didn't have to travel so far. ANR has been in Cairns this year. In two years time ANR will be held in San Francisco and you may recognize this island. This is Alcatraz, um, the state penitentiary of, of great notoriety and those are the bedrooms in there. And 
I often find that families, when they come and see me for the first time, have been misled into believing that molecular radiotherapy is delivered in places like this, that it's a horrible, hostile, dark, unpleasant environment where they are separated from their children who are imprisoned for weeks on end in lead-lined rooms. That, in fact, even though it's a widely believed, is a complete fallacy, I'm pleased to say. We have light, airy, spacious rooms. This is our hospital, and the children's floor is the uh, 11th floor. And from the uh, two dedicated suites we have for treating children with molecular radiotherapy, we have wonderful views across to the west of London, um, and we have everything we hope that a child would need. Of course, children vary from being infants and toddlers through to being teenagers, and so we do have to make sure that um, we change the toys appropriately and the, the DVDs and things like that. It gets a bit embarrassing if a three-year-old gets hold of the DVD that the 17-year-old left from the previous week. Um, so we do try and provide age-appropriate entertainments for our children. And I think the key things here are not only do we have good facilities for delivering uh, the treatment safely in terms of radiation protection, but uh, it's in a proper paediatric care environment where we have children's doctors and children's nurses who can deal with all the things that children need. I think it is not good practice to take young children and put them into an adult hospital for this sort of treatment uh, without the appropriate support. And of course, children need their parents, and uh, so we have adjacent parental stay areas. Um, as well, we have a home from home, a house just outside the hospital, where very often the whole of the family will decamp to Paul's house, as it's known, um, and then one parent will stay with the child on the ward, and they then may take it in turns, so that the child has always got somebody they love and know with them, um, but each of those parents has the opportunity to have a break and go to Paul's house, have a shower, go out shopping, um, have a drink if they need one, um, and uh, so on. So you need a big team of professionals to deliver this sort of treatment. Uh, we are blessed to have some very good therapeutic radiographers with special expertise in this who do a lot of the liaison with the families and also with the referring hospitals and really coordinate things. And they are the people who are responsible for making sure that the promises that I give are actually delivered. We need physicists for radiation protection and dosimetry. Uh, we need to work hand in hand with experienced pediatric um, uh, oncologists. We need nuclear medicine physicians. And very importantly, uh, we need play specialists. And this is Emma over there. So the treatment comes in a protected cart when it is administered. Um, but the most important thing is to try and keep life as normal as possible for the child. Um, and we have uh, the ability to designate responsible non-pregnant adults as comforters and carers. Um, they're known by other names um, in different places, but that's the term in the uh, British legislation. Uh, usually they're parents, but they can be grandparents, they can be aunts and uncles, they can be older siblings, they can be people who are not related at all, but um, they are uh, designated to be there to provide the care and comfort for the child during treatment. So clearly, as I said, we have doctors and nurses to do the things that doctors and nurses need to do, but we expect most routine childcare to be delivered by the comforters and carers. Um, so feeding, dressing, washing, toileting, those sort of things, uh, entertainment. 
And that's why we uh, have the family accommodation. It's why we have the adjacent space where uh, family can sleep. And we need to uh, train these people um, so that uh, they can minimize their own uh, radiation exposure. It's very important that we have uh, dedicated on-site nuclear medicine facilities to do all the uh, necessary scanning and imaging uh, with the ability to perform scans under a general anaesthetic if necessary. So radiation protection is very important. Most people are very scared of uh, radioactivity and, you know, rightly so. Um, but if you look after radiation carefully and if you follow sensible precautions, then comforters and carers can keep their own personal radiation exposure very low, as I shall demonstrate to you. There are two separate things to think about. Firstly, if you have a radioactive patient because they've had the radioactive drug administered to them, there will be radiation directly emanating from the patient. This is uh, gamma radiation, and the three things that are important uh, to minimize the uh, radiation exposure to comforters and carers from this source is time, distance, and barriers. So clearly, if you shorten the time when you're in very close contact with the child, then that will reduce your exposure. So if you spend two minutes doing a job, getting them dressed or washed, rather than four minutes, then your radiation exposure will be half. Distance is important. If you are sitting, uh, say, a meter away from your child, you're getting a certain exposure. If you sit two meters away, you'll be getting less. Uh, you'll be getting, in fact, a quarter of what you'll be getting one meter away. If the child's happy and playing and you can sit three meters away, you'll be getting a ninth of what you would have got if you were just one meter away. So a very small increase in distance um, can be a big reduction in comforters and carers' radiation exposure. And most children, even very young children, are quite happy to sit and to play and to do things by themselves, knowing that their mum is within sight, within talking distance, even if not sitting right uh, beside them. And then thirdly, we have barriers. We have lead shields on wheels. Um, and these are perhaps the least important way of reducing the radiation exposure. But if you sit behind them, it will provide some shielding uh, to your body as well. The other sort of uh, radiation protection we need to think about is protection against everything that emerges from the child. Now, you know what children are like. Poo, pee, puke, perspiration. All of that can be radioactive if the child is radioactive, and you don't want to get that on you. So we uh, advise people to wear plastic aprons, gloves if they're doing anything in terms of direct touch, uh, and overshoes. And that's as much to make sure that if they tread in a puddle of something unsavory, they don't then walk that out of the room to other parts of the hospital and you take the shoes off uh, by the door. So it may seem a bit um, cumbersome, but actually these things are quite simple. We need to think about waste disposal. For uh, older children who are continent, they can go to the ensuite bathroom and go to the loo there. Little girls are fine, but we have to encourage little boys to sit down because they're not very good with their aim. Uh, younger children, we would have in nappies if they're not um, continent. In some hospitals, some other countries, they would have a urinary catheter put in, but I think that's unnecessary and not very pleasant. Um, and then the protective clothing like the gowns and the gloves and the overshoes all needs to be uh, stored. The nappies, we use disposable nappies and they're macerated and they go into the sewer. Things like bed sheets, clothing can also become uh, contaminated, personal effects and toys. Um, children who chew the ears on their toy teddy bears um, because the saliva becomes quite radioactive. Um, we'll find that they become radioactive. So we would encourage 
families not to bring the child's most favourite toy into hospital, but to bring something perhaps new that they're less emotionally attached to that can be left behind if it becomes uh, contaminated. So everything, of course, is governed with a whole raft of legislation and strange acronyms are created. So there's something called IRMA, who you'd imagine might be your aunt or something like that, but it's not. It's the Ionising Radiation Medical Exposure Regulations, which uh, tell us what to do. And so for comforters and carers, we have to get written informed consent beforehand so they know what they're letting themselves in for. We have to ensure that they're trained and we have to monitor their radiation exposure. And if you are then designated as a comforter and carer, you have no restrictions at all on your time with the child. You can spend as long with the child as necessary to comfort and care for the patient. So there are no arbitrary, you can have 20 minutes or anything like that. But you have to do everything you can to keep your own personal radiation exposure as low as reasonably achievable, which is another acronym, ALARA. And it was quite difficult explaining this to a family when the little girl in question was called ALARA. Um, but uh, ALARA is, is, is quite a, a well-recognised principle to follow. So the rules and the guidance probably vary from nation to nation. The amount of radiation exposure that people can get is measured in a unit called a sievert, or one thousandth of a sievert is a millisievert, or a millionth of a sievert is a micro sievert. And the suggestions are um, for the general population, or the rules for the general population are that you're allowed one millisievert over a calendar year, or five millisieverts over five consecutive calendar years. For comforters and carers, as I say, there is no limit, but there is a recommendation that it is kept below five millisieverts from uh, one course of treatment. This is about 10 years worth of data on uh, patients that we have treated, and it describes different treatments. And the first thing to notice is that the y-axis, the up and down axis, has got different units, so they're not the same. So lutetium dotatate treatment in the uh, bottom corner here, as you can see, the biggest dose that anybody got was about 50 microsieverts, which is essentially nothing at all. Um, for the radioactive iodine in the other bottom corner, which is what we use for children with thyroid cancer. Uh, again, the uh, doses were very low. The top one there was about 250 microsieverts. The average was probably about 100 uh, microsieverts. So that is a tenth of uh, one, and it's about a fiftieth of what would have been considered acceptable. So for those treatments, the exposures are very, very low indeed for comforters and carers. For MIBG treatment, um, we give it in two different ways. So the MATIN schedule is a high administered activity, two administrations uh, within uh, two weeks. Um, and for those, the exposures are higher. So the numbers up on the um, vertical axis are in uh, thousands of microsieverts or millisieverts and we remember that five was the number that we we're supposed to be below and you can see that for the mat in all but one case was below five the vast majority of those were below one so even with this higher activity treatment the doses to comforters and carers are still uh, very low and similarly, for the single administration of MIBG, again, uh, all bar two were below uh, one, and they were both below five. And the little asterisk and diamond figures indicate that there were special reasons uh, for the high uh, levels for those two patients. I think people sometimes tend to think that somebody or something is either radioactive or 
not radioactive, but in fact there are different degrees of radioactivity and we measure the residual radioactivity that may be left in a child in units called megabecquerels. And if you're 800 or above, then that requires the full precautions. If you are below 30, then you have no restrictions whatsoever. And then in between 30 at the bottom and 800 at the top, there are various uh, degrees of uh, restriction. So below 800, we will let children, if they're well, out of the ward for a little while so they can go and play in the park. Um, we don't want them to go and sit in a cinema next to a young lady that they've never met before who might perhaps be pregnant. Um, and the restrictions become progressively less as you uh, get down. So neuroblastoma you know about, but this is just a brief reminder of some of the important features. Neuroblastoma is a very varied disease, and we need to take into account age and stage and tumour biology in order to work out what risk group the patient is in. The treatment results for low and intermediate risk disease are relatively good, whereas even with all the advances in treatment, the results for high-risk disease are still uh, comparatively poor. And um, it's high-risk disease which we're talking about this treatment for rather than low or intermediate risk. Neuroblastoma is quite a good candidate for molecular radiotherapy because compared with other tumours that children get like glioblastoma multiforme or osteosarcoma, neuroblastoma cells are relatively sensitive to radiation. So the radiation doses which can be effective for uh, neuroblastoma are much lower than would be required for some other tumours. High-risk neuroblastoma is very often widespread with deposits in different parts of the body, so that is a good um, thing for uh, a systemic treatment that goes everywhere and the other thing is that on the neuroblastoma cell we have multiple different targets that we can try and treat so this represents a neuroblastoma cell and on the surface you will find a molecule called the noradrenaline transporter molecule and that takes up MIBG you will also find uh, in most neuroblastoma patients, something called somatostatin receptors, and that takes up somatostatin analogues such as dotatate. And so those two are in uh, regular clinical use for molecular radiotherapy. But also, as you know, neuroblastoma cells have this GD2 uh, molecule on them, and this is what the antibodies which are used um, in immunotherapy are targeted against and it hasn't been widely used yet but there is a possibility that you can radio label the uh, antibodies used for immunotherapy and use that to um, target the neuroblastoma but that's still really a research area rather than an area which is in general clinical use. So MIBG, we call it MIBG because if we said meta-iodobenzylguanidine, we would really um, get tripped up over long and complicated words. Uh, but it's not really a complicated thing. As molecules go, it's quite small and quite simple. It's a little bit like adrenaline, so that means that it's taken up by cells of the sympathetic nervous system uh, in the same way. There's a whole range of drugs that children are sometimes on which can interfere with MIBG uptake, so one needs to be careful that the child isn't taking any of those. Because the iodine can break off the MIBG and just float about freely, that could be taken up into the thyroid gland, so we give medication to block thyroid gland uptake of free radioactive iodine to avoid uh, or to reduce the risk of longer term side effects. And also, MIBG can affect the blood pressure, so it's important to measure the blood pressure uh, during treatment. A couple of years ago, with colleagues, I looked at all the publications that had ever been published about MIBG over the last 
30, probably nearer 35 years now, uh, selected out those papers that uh, gave enough information on at least 10 patients and had a look to see what the reported response rates were. And all the ones at the top, so the vast majority that are in blue, um, were patients who had treatment with MIBG for relapsed and refractory disease. And as you can see, the response rates were, which were reported were varied between almost nothing uh, and went up to really about 75%. Um, on average, that's the red blob, the first red blob that you see coming down, it was about 35%. Now, a 35% response rate, if you assume that that's most likely to be accurate, um, is a pretty good response rate. You won't find many new drugs being investigated that have response rates of 35%. You may say, well, surely this is a treatment. Uh, it's been looked at scientifically. It must have a response rate. It can't have that wide range. Well, I think it can have that wide range if you have different patient groups, if you give different amounts or different schedules. Um, so one of the things that we have to do in the future is not just to say, shall we give MIBG treatment or shall we give something else, but to say, if we're going to use MIBG treatment, how do we ensure that we get the best possible outcomes? Because maybe it's possible to shift the response rate from 35% to something better than that. Maybe the average of 35% is because we have a really effective drug, but we're not necessarily using it in the right amounts or the right schedule. Um, the green and the yellow ones uh, below that uh, relate to alternative uh, uses, using it as part of consolidation therapy or as initial therapy in otherwise untreated patients. So what are the problems with MIBG therapy? Well, the first thing is that the amount that you can give is limited because the radiation attached to the MIBG uh, suppresses the blood count in the same way that chemotherapy does. And of course, over the years, we've now learned that we can give high-dose chemotherapy and support that with peripheral blood stem cells, or in the old days, it was bone marrow transplants, but now it's peripheral blood stem cells. Uh, and so you can get around that. And so now we can use peripheral blood stem cell support to give MIBG more safely, to give larger amounts um, and then hopefully achieve higher tumor doses. We can use it with other drugs such as uh, radiation sensitizers. Um, and we also have a uh, responsibility to investigate MIBG treatment more in randomized trials because of all those trials I showed you before, there wasn't a single randomized clinical trial. In 30 years of a drug being available, um, that's uh, a little bit shameful, really. So the schedule we have developed for the modern era of using uh, MIBG more intensively is to give two administrations two weeks apart, so day one and day 15. And obviously children differ in size. Infants and toddlers are smaller and older children, school-aged children and teenagers are bigger. So we give a weight-based administered activity to start with, and then we measure the whole body dose. And then on the basis of that information, we can calculate the amount you need to give two weeks later to give a desired whole body dose. The reason why you want to give a desired whole body dose is because uh, you don't want to give too much and get unexpected toxicity, but similarly, you don't want to give an inadequate amount because then your results might not be so good. We also nowadays use topotecan, um, which you'll be aware of is a drug that's used which has activity against neuroblastoma. But the reason we're using it here is not particularly because it's effective against neuroblastoma by itself, but because it helps to fix radiation damage in cells and increase the cell kill. It certainly does that in laboratory experiments. Uh, I have to say the evidence that it does that uh, in the clinical setting uh, isn't there, 
but um, I think there are enough pointers to test it out. So in terms of randomized trials, um, the American group, the Nant Consortium, have got an open uh, trial comparing three things, MIBG alone, MIBG with vincristine and irinotecan, uh, or MIBG with uh, another drug called virinostat, and that's an open and uh, recruiting trial. The European group uh, are developing a trial which is now close to opening and hopefully will be open uh, before Christmas in France and Italy and the UK and various other European countries, which we call uh, Veritas. So the design for Veritas is it takes those newly diagnosed patients with high-risk neuroblastoma, metastatic high-risk neuroblastoma, who have had induction chemotherapy with whatever schedule is being used, COJEC or N7, but who have not responded well. We know that about three-quarters of patients respond well to induction chemotherapy, but about a quarter don't. So it's those quarter who are poor responders that we are trying to help here. Uh, because we know from historical experience that non-responders have a very, very poor outcome in comparison with those who respond quickly. They will get some further chemotherapy with irinotecan and temozolomide, and then they will have a different treatment depending which arm they're randomized to. You may have heard um, the results presented by Julie Park earlier this week about double high-dose chemotherapy being better than single high-dose, and this is built on that same concept. So we are comparing two forms of high-dose treatment. Uh, in both arms, patients will get busulfan and melphalan, which is the European preferred high-dose chemotherapy schedule, which we have demonstrated in a previous clinical trial to be better in our patient population with the induction chemotherapy that we use uh, than the CEM regimen. Um, but patients will get either high-dose thiotepa before their busulfan and melphalan or MIBG and topotecan, as I've described, before their busulfan and melphalan. And then afterwards, we hope they will have immunotherapy and uh, we will see what the outcome is. So MIBG, I think I would say, is established treatment. What we're talking now about peptide receptor radionuclide therapy still has to be regarded as experimental. We have in the UK a phase one and two study in progress, which we call LUDO, because the treatment is lutetium dotatate. Uh, we need to give uh, an infusion of amino acids at the same time to protect the kidneys from um, being targeted, but that seems to work quite well. This is uh, imaging of a patient with um, PET CT scans who had um, quite extensive relapse disease. You can see in the panel on the left uh, disease down in the pelvis above the bladder and in lymph nodes going up towards the kidney and uh, then going on after treatment, things gradually go away until you end up with a much more uh, normal looking scan. This is the same patient showing cross-sectional uh, slices of the PET-CT scan through the pelvis. And uh, you can see in the top panel, the first one, quite a sizable uh, neuroblastoma tumor. The second panel, it has shrunk very substantially. And the uh, bottom one, well, actually, it's still there, but it is very tiny by comparison. So I think that was a good response. This is a different patient. Um, he had a very uh, large uh, mass in his left groin, uh, which you can see here on the fused PET imaging. And uh, you can also see from the um, uh, maximum intensity projection scan, he had something in his <coughs> left leg uh, just above the knee. And he had one administration of lutetium dotatate, then he came in for a second, and the scan after the second showed that the mass in the groin had essentially completely disappeared. In fact, we didn't need a scan to know that because there had been something the size of a cricket ball that had just gone. 
um, and also the bit in the leg is uh, better as well. And that child had other problems uh, not related to the treatment afterwards, so we didn't go on and give him any more treatment, and he was off treatment for over 12 months before there was any uh, evidence of disease progression. So lutetium dotatate can work very well, um, but clearly I'm showing you the best results and at the moment, because the trial is ongoing, I can't share the results of that trial uh, with you. Um, but suffice to say that the Independent Data Monitoring Committee has recently looked at our results and said it's very important that we continue with the trial. So I've mentioned two different treatments, MIBG treatment and dotatate treatment. And the question is, is it one or the other? Is one better than the other? Is one worse than the other? Which one should you use? And I want to show you two pieces of evidence that suggests that maybe the future might be to use them together. The first one, these colourful pictures on the left, are a tissue bank study that we did. We got 100 samples of neuroblastomas that were in a tissue bank, and we stained them to look to see if they had the molecules that take up MIBG, and we stained them to look and see if they had the molecules that uh, take up dotatate, and we found that there was a complete... Uh, mismatch. So some took up one, some took up the other, some took up both, and it could sometimes be a bit patchy within the tumours. So that suggests that if we're trying to target all the neuroblastoma cells, then targeting both pathways might be better than targeting one pathway alone. And we've also uh, looked at a lot of patients who've had scans and these two scans that you see on the right-hand side, you'd think they were different patients, wouldn't you? But they're, in fact, the same patient. The scan on the left is an MIBG scan, and that shows uptake in lumps of disease in the central part of the chest, but very little elsewhere. And the one on the uh, right-hand side is a dotatate scan, and as you can see, that shows patchy uptake throughout the skeleton, which isn't shown on the MIBG scan. But interestingly the mass of disease in the chest doesn't show up on the dotatate scan, although it showed up on the MIBG scan. And that would suggest that for this patient and others like him, to use both treatments might be better than using uh, either treatment by itself, because that way you can have a greater certainty that you're going to target all the um, neuroblastoma cells. So I think in the future, one of the trials that we would like to do is to test out combination treatment. Dosimetry means measuring the dose that we give and uh, we believe this is very important because there is an uncertain relationship between the amount that you object and the amount of radiation that ends up in the whole body um, or in the tumour. So if we took all of you and we gave you an injection of radioactivity all of the same amount, some of you would keep it in your body for longer and you would therefore get a higher radiation dose. Some of you would pee it out or poo it out much faster and you would get a lower radiation dose. If you had neuroblastoma tumours in your body, some of those would take up these drugs much more avidly and hold it there for longer and therefore get a higher radiation dose. Um, and uh, others would have less. So measuring these things is important because the amount that you inject is not the amount that the tumour gets. So whole body and tumour dosimetry is important, and this is the sort of kit that we use to do it. Um, and we should be much more personalised in what we do. One size fits all is a bit of a historical concept. So just moving swiftly on, that's how we do it. Um, various examples... So we think dosimetry is essential in trials to learn more because that will enable us to improve patient outcomes. So just the last slide then is looking forward at what we might do in the future. There are other indications, other diseases where we can use targeted radiation. Thyroid cancer, very classically. Neuroendocrine cancers. More experimental things, we have a trial opening uh, looking at a labelled monoclonal antibody as an alternative to total body radiation as conditioning for bone marrow transplantation for leukaemia. There is a drug called radium-223, 
which has been shown to be benefiting old men with prostate cancer, might be useful for children with osteosarcoma. Um, we can do dosimetry before we give treatment using techniques such as uh, PET scans beforehand, and then there are alternative uh, preparations that are being investigated experimentally but haven't yet come into clinical use, such as astatine or carrier-free MIBG. So I think that's more or less all I was going to say, but just to conclude that molecular radiotherapy is actually pretty wonderful stuff. Um, and uh, I think it's an area which has been underexplored in clinical trials and needs further investigation because we know that it works for some patients and I believe that if we use it more cleverly, we could make it work for more patients. So, thank you very much.